what an incredible blessing it is for you to be listening to this today. Uh, not just because of how much I appreciate you taking the time to be here, to listen to this conversation, but because we have this access, we have this ability to learn from one another, to think that I'm sitting in an office, you know, in my home in Alberta, Canada, and you are wherever you are. Uh, we have listeners all over the world. It, it's such an incredible thing. And I, and I think that's something that we need to really celebrate, need to take advantage of. But I also think about how we tend to get really excited about people across the world, people sharing their ideas. But a lot of times we don't necessarily necessarily celebrate the people that are closest to us, the people that um, are across the hallway from us. And I'll give you an example uh, from my own time in education. I remember at one of my schools uh, where I was teaching at, they would do this uh, little award ceremony every single year to, to celebrate a teacher. And they did basically the teacher of the year. And one year it was, uh, they were doing this conversation. I was listening and I had a really good year. I was really proud of the work that I was doing. And I remember them talking and kind of describing the teacher that was about to be celebrated. And I'm thinking, I'm going to win. I'm going to win this, this award. And I was really excited about it. And then they actually gave it to someone else on my staff. And the first thing that I thought was not good for them or they deserved it. The first thing I thought was, that should have been me. Why wasn't it me? And I look back on that and I think of that teacher. And to be honest with you, he's no longer with us today. And he was an incredible teacher. He's an incredible mentor. He, he was an amazing educator and I looked up to him. And I'm not necessarily saying he wasn't deserving. I wasn't, I, none of that stuff. But instead of actually looking at all the things that he contributed to the school, all the things that he did, the first thing I thought about was why couldn't this be me? Why couldn't this, you know, and I, I felt a little resentment towards him at that time. And I, I think a lot of times when we point to this, we always point to like somebody had this towards me or maybe someone didn't else appreciate my work. But I think it's really important that I shared that story because it was like me having that feeling about someone else. We always point to maybe the negatives in other people, but then do we take a look and say like, are we being that person? Are we being that same feeling. And instead of like going up to him and celebrating him and giving him like a real, I probably congratulated him to be honest with you, but it was like probably like, Hey, way to go, you know, made some like sarcastic comment. I didn't really authentically celebrate that moment. And you know, later I did. And this is a person that I learned a ton from person that I looked up to. And I think a lot about that. I think a lot about other instances where I felt the same way, where people didn't necessarily appreciate me in the places that I worked. And what that did for my confidence, what that did, you know, maybe some uh, resentment to maybe some of the places I worked because I didn't feel that. But I also have to be honest that I was that person to other people too. And are, are we that to each other? It is so amazing that we can celebrate people across the world, but it doesn't mean anything if we can't pe celebrate people across the hallway. And in my conversation today with Dr. Matthew Joseph, we talked about this. We talked about how this impacts people and how we have this opportunity to connect with other people across the world and how we need to take advantage, but how important it is to celebrate and learn from maybe people that are doing, you know, really incredible stuff, not necessarily better than you, but stuff that you can still learn from and how we need to celebrate those in our own buildings. So I really appreciate the conversation. I know you're going to love it. Thank you for joining another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos with another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And today I have Dr. Matthew Joseph, who, who goes by Matt. And uh, we were having a conversation before. Uh, and Matt's done a lot of different things. He's been a teacher. He's been a school-based administrator. He's worked in central office. Uh, he's also an author. He has a, a, a book called uh, The Power Connections that's already out. He has another one coming out that's called Stronger Together. And so just kind of having these conversations. And uh, we were talking about the, the value of kind of connecting and you know uh matt's in uh the boston area foxborough right yep. shout out to the patriots yep. and then uh who sorry they didn't win yesterday when we're recording this i don't know if you're a patriots fan does that matter yeah, it's, it's funny enough i don't know this is audio you see my little dolphins guy right there so i'm actually oh. not so the dolphins beat the patriots yesterday so shout, shout out dolphins <laughs> <laughs> so so matt thanks for thanks for taking sure. the time to be on the podcast and uh for those people who don't know you just kind of can you just tell a little bit about who you are and just a little bit about your educational journey 
Sure. Um, Matt Joseph uh, from Massachusetts, from Western Mass originally, Pittsfield, where GE headquarters was for a long time. And um, I was a, a teacher there. And then I, I, after going to Springfield College, and then I had an opportunity to become a principal. So I moved out in Eastern Mass and near the Foxborough era, area, like George said, and I had to be, was a principal in Attleboro, Mass, and then in Natick. And then had an opportunity to be central office administrator as the director of digital learning and innovation in Milford Public Schools, and then as the director of curriculum instruction in Leicester Public Schools. And then after meeting Brian Aspinall, fellow Canadian, and working really closely with Codebreaker and doing some activities, um, took a break from the public education and central office to start doing some publishing, some more writing, and kind of harnessing my own own team and, and starting to do more professional development and collaborating with educators, you know, across the country. Okay. So I gotta, I gotta ask you this right away. So you so, said, you said something about Springfield. Yeah. Springfield is where I went to college. Is it, is this, college. so what's birthplace the place of basketball? I, no, sorry. Okay. Now we're going to get in a fight. The birthplace. Well, actually it isn't the birthplace of basketball, but the person who invented basketball is Canadian. You know this, right? Uh, James Naismith. Naismith. Yeah, he's okay. Canadian. He's Canadian, yeah, he right? To yeah, but he's using he was in Kansas, right? So like I was yeah, when he was you in say, Kansas. Because like the the reason I wanted to ask you is like Springfield, like what's the Springfield? Because there's like a zillion Springfields in the United States, right? What's the Springfield yeah. like? Is it this? Is it the home? Is it the Simpsons Springfield? Um, no, Bart does not go there. But Springfield, Massachusetts, where the Hall of Fame is, the Basketball Hall of Fame. Yeah. And George Naismith um, worked at Springfield College, and that's where the original Peach Basket was. It, really? Like, uh, yeah. But I still, I still want to know where I want to know which Springfield it is for the Simpsons. It's Do you know not this? the Simpsons Springfield All for right. sure. <laughs> All right. So, so <laughs> sorry, Bart. That, that that whole that whole conversation I think there's was a Springfield just, in every state. So yeah, I swear. So hey, so like, tell me, you, yeah. you said that your 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 job at the central office was digital learning and innovation is that correct yeah tell me tell me tell me tell me a little bit about like obviously you know people know my work innovators mindset yeah, and that connection course. to it so like what what did that job entail right so like we like people have an assumption about the title but like what did that job actually entail yeah so um i'm gonna i'm gonna take a little while to get there just to sure. give a basis of it so when i was in pittsfield actually Again, for those listening in the States, Maine was one of the first states to go one-to-one. -one. They call it the Maine Learning mm -hmm. Initiative with, from Apple, God, 17, 18 years ago. And Berkshire County, where I was a teacher in Pittsfield, Mass., we did Berkshire County, BWLI, Berkshire Wireless Learning Initiative, Learn from Maine. And I was the one of the two people who launched the first one-to-one -one initiative in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. again, 16 years ago. And then I learned quickly, like technology leadership is wonderful, but if you're not the leader of the school, people look at you like a used car right. salesman, or at least they did. Like, oh right. yeah, that's cute, but we're good. This is back when the web quests and all those things. It was like one-to-one -one so, Blackberries, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, we had the uh, uh, apples for, for our, so at that point I said, you know, uh, screw it, I'm gonna be a principal then, oh, fine. Mm -hmm. That's been whole my whole life. When someone says I can't do it, I'm gonna do it. So I was a principal for 10 years, and then after I finished Boston College, I said, I want to do something in central office, but I don't really want to do the assistant superintendent, superintendent right. route. So I had an opportunity to do the director of digital learning innovation. So I launched a one-to-one -one initiative, but I went about it as an instructional leader. It wasn't the tech guy. It wasn't right. bringing in devices because, you know, one-to-one -one initiative is just a math problem. 3,000 kids, 3,000 devices. You solved a math problem. It's about changing instruction. <laughs> right. So, my, so my issue was what happens when the computers get out of the boxes, not getting the boxes in, mm -hmm. taking those devices into classrooms. And, and, you know, what I would say at nauseum to our staff is my job is to help you make the classroom as dynamic as the world around us. Mm -hmm. And I do that through instructional practices. So that was what the role was, was really bringing instructional practices and having the tools match the instruction. One of the things I tried to always get away from was the wow factor. I said, let's get away from the wow factor. Wow. YouTube is cool. Wow. Right. This is cool. It's not about that. It's about matching the technology with the instructions so that students can really create something and not just consume because you know, right. digital worksheets are no different than paper worksheets. 
you know that. Like, yeah. if, who am I talking? It's, like, it's the, the, the only difference is that there, it's like it's accelerated bad practice, right? It's it's still bad yeah, practice, exactly. but faster. It's five hundred dollar worksheet on an iPad. Yeah, yeah. Like so, there. You know, there's there's a couple of things that I kind of want to ask you about. The the first thing Go. that you said that was really interesting, and this I I kind of had a very similar experience. We have like a lot of you know mirroring in our careers. <laughs> is that is that um, when I was like when I was in. Uh, a school as like the tech lead and you know I was like this on the same I, I guess pay scale as a teacher and it was like I would say stuff and they're like you know some people we, and some of it was like whatever right like whatever <laughs> right and then I had the same kind of like a focus area but as a principal and it was a very different you know the the approach was the same but I think the title had changed and, and like I I, I do you know, I, it's not that I don't believe in collaborative leadership, but there is something about when it's your boss saying it, do you know what I mean? And I think yeah. it's when it, when it's like, Hey, our, you know, our principal actually thinks this is important. So maybe I need to kind of jump on too. like, there, there is some of that too. Now you can do the, you can do the opposite if you're a terrible boss, right? You can, that the opposite right. of effect can actually happen. But I remember like 100%. working with the superintendent saying, look, if you, if you, if you do this in front of everybody, you'll make my job at central office much easier because it's not like, Oh, that's a George thing or that's a Matt thing. It's like, no, this is how we kind of got to go forward. Right. So I think that like, is that was interesting that you said that because I, that was something that was an experience I had. Um, the other thing that I wanted just to just kind of ask you about, and this has been shared over and over again. So a lot of schools that went one-to-one, -one, it's actually, they'll say like, Hey, there's like no improvement in learning when they went one-to-one. -one. And I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. It's that it was just like, you, like what do you think is going to happen when you just give a person a computer and nothing changes about the teaching and, and learning in the classroom right. right and so i think part of it too is even some of the teaching and learning maybe change but the the results are not the same or the results are still the same because the way that we assess is the same right Correct. so we're not necessarily looking at at uh you know kids being creative doing some really incredible things we're like still trying to measure them based on same metrics. So like this is this is a big contention that I've had with people is that if you're asking for personalized learning, then you have to personal you can't standardize the assessments. You have to think differently about how we do this. So it's like, hey, we're going to give really personalized learning, but every kid actually should come out being the same person, right? right As opposed end, to doing that. Yeah, so like how did you deal with like how did you because I, I am sure that, you know, do, being one to one, you've heard some of the arguments I just, you know, have been shared with me over and over again. But like, how do you, how do you, how did you deal with that in your role? So one of the things I really tried to break it down, because as you said, we having the same assessment practices mm -hmm. essentially was like sh using the shiny new tool. But when it right. came time to really be accountable, let's go back to what we know. Right. And I would talk a lot about transfer of learning. So I'd say, yeah, in a good classroom, you teach you check their progress, you assess them, and you just keep doing that. Right. And I said, but really when we start to get into the changing practice is we teach, you let them practice, and then they transfer their knowledge. You assess along the way. The assessment mm -hmm. happens all the time. How are we allowing students to transfer their learning? And if it's through you know, a digital tool, if it's through multiple avenues, if it's writing a paper, as long right. as we're getting students to transfer knowledge. So we started to use um, Wakelet to create um, student portfolios. We created YouTube channels. For, it was amazing to see science, high school science, and I shared with you earlier, was something that I was later in my career that I started to learn about high school leadership. Our science students created YouTube channels, and they would uh, film over time labs and then explain right. it. And, and the, the biggest contention I'd have as a district leader is some principal would say, yeah, but how do we grade that? And then right. we started to talk about, they're like, okay, then we'll give them a test after. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're assessing transfer of learning, right. not just the, the singular output. Right. How are students transferring what they learn? And if they're you know, creating a podcast and share it to the world, then you assess their knowledge. You don't assess just a singular product. Right, you don't assess the paper. podcast. Right. It's, it's, yeah. it's what is the knowledge if you're, you know, if we were teaching biology, this was one of the classes I saw and it was about, you know, splitting cells and different components, assess their knowledge. And, and that's where the assessment comes in. And, and however they do it, I shared a story with you in the, the last podcast where I wrote a journal, like mm -hmm. allow students to 
access the knowledge, they how they feel comfortable, and they present it to you because we do that in the real world, right? Why are right. we not modeling that in, in, in schools? Right, and I think, so, and I got, I got a follow-up question for you, and I'm going to get your yeah. input because this is actually like a big pushback that I just got recently. And so the... Um, so like here, here's and here's a different way to look at it. like let's let's pull technology out of this right so yep. I, I actually have a kid sharing their knowledge with me in a science curriculum objective right and then they lose marks because their grammar wasn't great in explaining it or they spelled it and it's like well no you can talk about that but that actually isn't actually assessing their knowledge of science so when we're talking like if the objective is you know, a, but you're talking about all these other things. And so I think that it's like, well, but in the real world, you got to spell correct. Yeah. And you can still have that conversation, but that doesn't actually tell me the conversation that a student has, you know, like what the, what the child knows in science. So when you're looking at, so then taking it to the notion of technology is like, Hey, yeah, it's a video, right? So you're not assessing the right. video. You're assessing the kid's understanding of the concept that they're actually explaining the same way that you would assess it if they, if they wrote it like you'd assess what their knowledge is in that area. And so the, 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 the feedback or the thoughts I would love to hear is that I actually was in a district talking about how I'm not a big fan of, uh, of, and maybe this is the wrong terminology, common assessments. And it's like the kids are tested same day, same way was the terminology error. Like we're assessed same way, same day. I was like, well, I'm, no, I'm not good. I'm not good with that. And they're like, well, that's equity. I'm like, Actually, it's the opposite. No, it's the opposite. Right. Yeah. To say like every kid. So let's say that um, you are giving like a written test and uh, English is not my first language. And then basically I can't explain that concept using the language you choose for me to explain it. But I know the concept. Then you're actually hurting me a little bit. And this kind of goes back to that notion. So what I, you know, what I talk about, and I, maybe this is just curriculum or lack of a better term, is that there's a difference between the notion of common assessments and common understandings. Hey, I need every kid to be able to understand this concept, but I don't necessarily yeah. need them to actually share with me through the same way on the same day. Right. So like my like, and I know like common understandings is kind of like the curriculum, if you really think about it. But it is kind of acknowledging some kids are at different places at different times. Some kids express their self. Um, you, you had mentioned that you were very comfortable sharing projects and sharing your learning that way. And writing wasn't necessarily a thing when you were in K to 12. And so like to punish you in a science class because you're not a great writer doesn't seem to make sense. Now, to, if you're like, if the class is focused on writing and you're not writing, that's a whole different conversation. That's a whole different, right. yeah. But, but it's like, like what, so am I like totally, like what, what are your thoughts on there too? And like, you know, so, it was a great, uh, the person that we we're having conversation was very open uh, to what I was saying, but you know, that's, I think that's part of the, the thing is like to not go into these other places and just agree with everything saying like, hey, here is maybe a different perspective. And maybe, you know, maybe there's something I'm missing there too. So, so my perspective on this is we in education lump terms together that necessarily don't mean the same thing. Right. Like for me, one of the things, and I will get to that question, is the notion of PLCs. Right. Just because we sit in the same room doesn't mean we're a professional learning community. Right. Like there's a whole structure to that. Right. So it drives me crazy when people say, oh, we're a PLC. I've just met you. It's not possible. We're not looking at student <laughs> right. work. Like right. We're, we're, we're essentially just sharing a space. Like right. don't call it that. And assessment's another one of those words where there's common assessments, which for district and a school leader and as a former curriculum director is essentially given as a benchmark to show growth over time. But then you can't say common assessment in the example you, you gave for right. the science project. Like there's, there's assessing students growth over time. And I do believe that having those benchmarks and times are important. However, it's not every single thing. Like saying assessment for every time you ask a kid to show knowledge is just hurting the profession. When, you right. know, I shared, just shared about students doing YouTube, well, we're assessing their knowledge. It's not the common assessments. And I think we as teachers and educators and leaders get lumped into what can we see? We can see a score. We can see a rubric. And it's a little bit, to be honest with you, people being a little lazy that we're not putting in the effort to assess that knowledge, as you said. And, and one of the things, one story I remember about this is a student who was a senior was going into mm -hmm. college to be a special educator. And... The assignment was share knowledge of, of a topic. Right. And the only the only way that the teacher allowed the student to do it was to write a paper. 
So this student, in which I was really proud of her, yep. said, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do audio recording because how can I go into college and learn about differentiated assessment? And she made an audio recording and handed it to the teacher. And the teacher said, well, that wasn't the project. And she said, well, I wrote it. I read it. Right. It's exactly what you asked for. But now what, what about the student who can't write? And she, and she was she was very intelligent and said, you know, I want to go in to help students who have disabilities. What if I couldn't write? This was how I would right. have to do it. Right. And it was, and, and that was assessing the student's knowledge. Yeah. And that, that, that is, that is part of that conversation that we have to have is, is having this. There, there's something you said, um, and I, and I don't know what your thoughts on this because, uh, you know, having benchmarks for students at specific, and I don't know if you meant specific times, but I think this is one of the common, or this is one of the things I hear often in education is like, Hey, we need to know when kids are like our kids at this benchmark at this point. Uh, so I don't know if I can't remember if it was the book outliers is Malcolm Gladwell book. Mm-hmm. And I, this is something that connects with me because I'm Canadian. So it was actually like a right. Canadian example. <laughs> so they, they actually talked about, um, hockey players in the NHL. So a uh, huge, and I don't know if this is still true. Uh, but at the time of the book, and, and I'm going from memory of reading this book several years ago, years ago it, it was yeah. basically saying like the majority of NHL hockey players were born in January, February, and March, right? So they were born in those three months. So why, why is that? Like, what was the, and so like, and it may, I can't remember if it was outliers. It was something, it was a Malcolm Gladwell book for sure. So mm-hmm. don't quote me on, on the exact book or even I'm probably screwing up the story too. <laughs> so this sounds good. Say it yeah, of. like even if I make this up, it sounds good. So the, so like basically the, what he had, what he had connected was, so like if you think about a kid who's, so in Canada growing up, a kid that is five years old in it, that, turns five in January and a kid who turns five in December playing in the same league. Well, basically one fifth of their life. Yeah. They're like a year apart with only being alive for five years. And so (laughs) what happens right away is those kids that are, you know, older by a few months, which is like a huge percentage of their lifetime at that point, start getting actually weeded to like the better leagues. Right. And then they get the better coaching they get all these other things. And so like a lot of the kids that were born in December, you know, don't have that. Now, I don't know when Sidney Crosby or Wayne Gretzky were born or anything <laughs> like that, but, it, but that was one of the things. And so like understanding there is like, you know, especially our early learners, there's a huge discrepancy in age for kids in the same grade, like in kindergarten, right? Like there's a, yeah, a, a, a January kid versus a December kid or have a, a difference, you know, in, in time. Right. And so then, so that Absolutely. sometimes, so I don't know if that, that, I don't know if there's been any um, research or connections to that uh, in education, but when you think of it, like I, I, there's a, there's research and then there's just like, Hey, Oh yeah. That's like, like when I explain it to you, I don't know if you ever heard that story, but you're like, Oh yeah, it totally makes sense. Right. You could, I could yeah, see it. Makes what sense. And I think just a common idea. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. One of the clarifying things I wanted to jump into, especially using the hockey story and different things. When I was saying, where students are at a certain time. Right. One of the things I want to be clear is what I mean by that is I'm not comparing them to the other 23 kids in the class. Right, right. We're just comparing themselves to themselves. Right. So if, if the student who was, you know, for us in, in, in our public education here, we see that for the student who was born in August and the student who was born in September, because September starts school, August, that kid gets a whole nother year and right. they start a year later. Right. So that common assessment for benchmarking, again, from the, my job as when I was curriculum director and principal, it was for themselves. Right. So if I was eight months older than my, the kid who was sitting next to me, I'm not judged versus each other. We're, I'm judged about myself. And I think that's, that's where common assessment gets lost is that we're not comparing. It's not a group comparison. It's making sure that each student continues to grow right. at an appropriate pace. Yeah. The, the other thing I want to ask you about that you mentioned, and there's a lot of little things that you kind of triggered me, the, <laughs> the, the, the uh, well, triggered thinking anyway, the PLCs. I've actually kind yeah. of, uh, it's not that I have an issue with PLCs. It's exactly what you're talking about. I have an issue with the implementation of PLCs, right? So a lot of times somebody goes to some conference and it's not just PLCs. You're going to see there's a, there's a commonality in this with, with, <laughs> with all of these things, right? So some administrator goes to a conference, hears about PLCs and says, oh, look, like, look at this school. They implemented PLCs and look at all these things that changed. We're doing PLCs, right? And so they just kind of think like, we'll just do some, you know, like a little addition here, 
not change anything of our culture, not really no, think about the foundational elements. We're just going to do the thing, right? We're going to take all the shortcuts to get to that thing, right? And so like how, how like, so like one of the things that uh, Katie Novak and I do a course on, yep. on UDL. Um, and so part of my job, Katie is the, is the, knows UDL inside out. My focus is on how do you actually create the culture to support UDL, not not the UDL itself. But people are just like, no, no, just give me the UDL. I'm like, but that's the but, issue. You don't actually, you haven't changed any culture. You haven't talked about any of the language. So like, how did you yeah. deal with that in your role? I think that was part of it is getting to the fact that we are focusing our efforts on the wrong thing. Just because we're sitting in the same room, we're right. not a professional learning community. And, and this really struck me when I was a principal because we wanted to do common walkthroughs. And I did a lot of work when I was right. at DC studying culture. And I wrote a book on culture and, and different things. And the new book, Stronger Together, is about building that culture within a school that has the common mindset, not just the mm -hmm. common terminology. So it's really what it is, is starting with the end in mind. Why are you doing this? Right. As you just wrote about Katie, another Massachusetts educator who's yep. fabulous. I've seen her a few times. Um, <laughs> you can't give it up for Massachusetts educators. Um, it, it's about we're, here's the goal that we want to get to. And, and what I think you probably your course is about getting this universal design yep. into educators' hands. And you work backwards where you then come in at the beginning to start building that culture of like, yep. let's get in a common framework. Because PLCs is, is an actual thing. You look at student work, yep. you create a, an improvement plan. Like It's just not a, a phrase that you throw out there. Either is UDL. Like, oh, right. universal, great, give me the worksheet. I'll just fill it out. Right. It, it doesn't work that way. And it goes back to, you know, I use the, the big L word, the laziness. Sometimes principals, school leaders, district leaders right. want to check the box. Oh, here's the latest buzzwords. Let me let me say these things because then it's I'm going to will it into existence. Yeah, well, you actually use the terminology end in mind, which is you know a Stephen Covey thing. And uh, when we when I was principal, uh, I was really big into leader in me, right? That was like a huge thing. I thought it was I love I love the leader in me book. I'm like, wow, this is awesome. And so I was like, hey, let's let's actually look at implementing this program. I think this is going to be really really good. So um, a lot of the stuff that I, that is in the book leader and me, I love, I think it's really like, how do we develop kids as leaders and really kind of redefining what does it mean to actually be a leader? And to me, a leader is actually just, is actually having um, influence to move others forward in a positive manner in some, in some area, right? So it's not like mm -hmm. only administrators, some administrators are not leaders, some teachers are, are great leaders. Um, and so uh, we actually went to see some school. So I took a team of people from my staff and we went to see some schools uh, that were doing leader and me stuff, right? And we we went and saw it, and I was kind of like thrown off a little bit because I felt there was like a little bit of like zombieish language, and it was like, <laughs> "I will think win win," and it was like the kids weren't even thinking about it; they were just saying it, and it kind of right. like it kind of felt like, "Hey, I believe Compliance. in the ten I I believe in the tenets of this, but I also believe that it's that it's." the way that I'm seeing some of it, it's almost stripping away personality. So I'm not saying you can't do it without personality, but the way that I saw it. So the reason I bring this up is because I was like, as the principal, as a person who basically controlled the budget, I was like all in on this and thought it was amazing. Took my staff. We had like a five hour drive to see the school and it worked really well for them, but we knew our community really well. And then we talked and we're like, Hey, we love this idea. We love the, the ideas behind it but this isn't for us. Right. And to like, right. and I think a lot, like the reason I'm sharing the story, because I think a lot of leaders, sometimes we get really excited about things and then we go all in, whether we believe they're going to work or not when we get to, you know, right to it. And to like, to say to, for me to say to my staff, you know, I was all in it. We took some staff, we saw this. And as a community, we don't think this is going to work for us. We believe in right. some of the things and we're going to implement them maybe in our own way, but we're not going to like go all in money on this program because our school will be seen as a lighthouse school a leader in me, which is more right. about my ego than actually helping our community. Right? right. So I think part of that, people have to hear sometimes things that you didn't implement and why you didn't implement them, not just all the success stories, right? Like, Hey, sometimes we do have to pull back. And, and it's about really prototyping. Like we don't right. celebrate attempts enough, students, leadership, whatever it is, because we get caught up in this, okay, we've started. If we don't finish it, then 
that's on us. We're not right. successful when that's not at all how things evolve. Look at anything that's evolved and, and, and successful. It wasn't the first attempt. Right. And, and, and as you said, you know, you went, you saw, you evaluated it because every culture, every school, every country does it a little bit different. And I think when we start talking about leadership and we start talking about, you know, innovation, technology, any of that right. aside, it's about how can you find what the best match is for your community and your students. And, you know, you go to these big events and you see so many great things, but if you can't match it to what you're doing, you're just being a fraud because right. you're trying to do it like somebody else. Right. And, you know, I've said that to, to many people who've come to sessions I've done. This is just me sharing my story, how this, you know, guy from Massachusetts did it in his school and it worked with that community. It's not going to work in Atlanta right. the same way as it, as it does in, you know, Pittsfield, Massachusetts. It just doesn't work that way. But the central theme of what you believe in, that's where you get kind of rooted into yep. to doing this as what is important to you and what's important to your school and what are your values. Yeah. And that, that is like, that is kind of like the idea is really important, but like we always talk about relationships. The reason the relationships are so important is actually knowing your community knowing, you know, and how to build that. So how do we take this concept, these ideas, how do we make them applicable to our community, right? Not saying like, yeah. let's just carbon copy what this school did and it should work for a very different, unique thing, right? It's kind of having that individuality. And uh, I, I appreciate, you know, all the stuff that you're sharing with, with you know, with the, with the audience here today uh, and connections. And you actually wrote a book called The, the Power of Connections, and so like one of the ways that we actually connected, obviously through, uh, you know, through this podcast today, this is the first yep. time we, we've connected for a I long know. time over social media. Absolutely. This is the first time we've ever actually talked. Um, yeah, so awesome. like, tell us a little bit about uh, the book, Power Connections. Yeah. So the Power Connections came about because one of the things, and, and this has been a mindset of mine for, for, for a long time, that I was fortunate enough as a, as a, as a principal and then as a district leader to, to travel. I got to go to, to ISTE and FET and all of these events because for some reason they liked me coming and talking. So it was great that I got to go. And every time I would approach it like it's the last time I go. I have the best right. time. I take pictures. I love it. I, I meet people. And I just go in like that kid who's just their first time and it could be the last time and just really met a lot of, of individuals. And um, at the time, Brian Aspinall from Codebreaker was getting a fleet of, of authors as he pivoted in, in his role. And he, and he contacted me and he said, would you be interested in writing about something like that? And we kind of batted around some ideas and I said, yeah, how we can connect individuals and using that technology. And, and I've had that opportunity through either the technology events or I'm the yeah. you know, president elect of MASCD, which is the Massachusetts branch of ASCD. So running in two different kind of camps. And I said, yeah, let me, let me try this. So one of the things I said is I want to mimic. So we brought up Foxborough. I live near Foxborough. We used to go once a month to Fox to Gillette Patriots Place and principals, whoever would drive from local communities would come, a, a vendor would go to treat us to lunch. We'd hear their product and we would talk. We would mm -hmm. just talk out of our buildings, get out and, and, and meet and share stories, vent, mm -hmm. complain about teachers, complain about bosses, whatever, complain about each other. Who knows? <laughs> I said, we, how can we do that? And he said, well, that's what the book is. Share different ways that people can stay connected. I wrote it during COVID, but it's not a, a COVID book. Right. It's how can we stay connected through the use of the 21st century tools? And, you know, I talked about the first half of the book is really about why that's important. How when we have individual connections to, to people, we are driven. We want to be better. We want to reach out. If it, there's only two of us here, not we're having, or at least I am having a great time chatting, and you know, it, it's great. And and you live an eight-hour plane ride. We couldn't do this right. without without this technology. And they said, how can we live this? So I interviewed people who did YouTube shows. I interviewed people who were influencers. Mm -hmm. I researched Twitter chat. So it's not just like, hey, get together. It's fun. I did boxer book studies. I found ways that we can stay connected, but not just to socialize, how we're going to grow as a profession from everybody else. Right. It's essentially uh, is taking crowdsourcing and putting strategy to it. How can we crowdsource educational leaders, educators to all of these great ideas? And how can I, Matt Joseph, or you access this anytime I want? Because we right. talk about personalized PD, we talk about personalized learning all the time. But if it's not strategic, you're just right. kind of throwing darts. 
So I wanted to give uh, options and, and then I wanted to live it. So I, I just jumped on every podcast I could just to not in a self promotion, but to learn what do people do? Right. How do you do it? Why do you do it? Joined tons of Twitter chats so that I could, again, what's impactful, what's not impactful. And then I started, as we shared before, a leadership lounge every Friday at 10 o'clock. And we have leaders from Canada, from the United States, from Australia, from, you know, Georgina, from, from, from Jordan jumps on and we just get together for an hour. And I wanted to model those meetups, right. those like leader meetups. And that's what we do. And it's been amazing to learn from other educators and just listen and, and just talk through things. And so many positive, rela- there are so many people I call friends, really good friends. I've never been in the same zip code. Right. And sometimes people don't understand that, but it's about how you push each other and how you learn from each other, that that's what the power of connection is. It's not just a time to have, because at the beginning of COVID, it was the social happy hours, right? Like, cool, let's all get together, have a drink together. That wore off real thin. Right. <laughs> and then it was how are we going to use these, these resources to right. better ourselves during this time that we can't leave our house. And now continuing that forward, now that we can go into our brick and mortar schools or whatever we're doing, how do we stay connected to continue to grow? How are we sharing our voice? How are we sharing our products? And let's not get away from sharing because we're just back into a building. Yeah, and it's not, it, just so you know, it's it's postal codes in Canada. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the... the well, it's actually funny because like anytime I go to, to stay in a hotel in the U.S., they're like, what's your zip code? I'm like, and then I say like T and they're like, what? The, why is there a T? And I'm like, because we don't use zip codes. We use postal codes. They have letters <laughs> in them. They're just thrown off. That's I just, awesome. Yeah, whatever. I just think it's, yeah. it's a funny little side story, you know, for, yeah, well, for the Americans well, uh, in the you know, audience. Because Canadians, a Canadian, you know, a co-breakers Canadian company, when I handed in the manuscript <laughs> and, and, and Daphne right. McMenamin, she was the editor. Right. She would just leave notes like, I have no idea what this word means. I'm like, <laughs> what? Yeah. Just so you know, every, awesome. every, so if you are anywhere near my age and you're asked for a zip code and you're Canadian, you just say 90210. <laughs> that's what we just <laughs> do. That's the one we know. Right. That's that, uh, what that's we know. All. We know that's a zip that's code. That's it. We don't, we don't, right? So, like, anytime, like, I can't, like, I'm trying to, like, charge something in credit card, they're like, zip code. I'm like, ah, like, what am I going to put? I just put 90210. Still to That's this day. Awesome. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> that is fabulous. Hey, so, I, I, I the, you, you kind of actually led beautifully to um, your, your next book that's actually coming out really soon. Uh, like, when, when is, so we're recording this uh, in the middle of September. When is it? get it out in the next, uh, by the mid October. Okay. So, like, by the time this podcast is out, um, you'll actually probably will be released. And so, the, the title of that is Stronger Together which I think obviously kind of connects with this idea is like when we do have this connection, how do we actually lead forward? So what, what's that book about that's coming out right away? So, one of the, so when I was at Boston College, I studied, um, my, my, my dissertation study was how to enhance teacher job satisfaction. How do, we, how do we make being in school fun, essentially? How do we, because we want to retain our staff. Again, I'm not going to get into the boring study of it, but it's essentially how do we keep teachers in the same building so we don't have to retrain educators every year? So I learned a lot. I studied a lot of Elizabeth City of walkthroughs and, and, and mm-hmm. promoting each other and, and doing within the building. And then I did a lot of research on connections and, and it was wonderful and fun. And then what happened is we all went back to school in September. And I was like, okay, well, we can't forget about our colleagues. So I wrote a whole you know book about connecting with people all over the world. Let's make sure we're also not forgetting the people in front of us. Because sometimes right. what happens when we have this technology i can grab my phone and do a youtube video and anyone in the world can watch it right it's cool right we're talking in two different countries but what about the person next door to you so what this was is is really it's it's called stronger together the power of connections within a school community right and it goes through ways that we can maximize both how can we do learning walks as a team how can we have peer collaboration how can we better each other and really talking about looking at a school that has an us mentality. No, because I've always said, everybody's on the same team when you walk through the door. We have different roles, we do different jobs, right. but we're, we, what gets lost is we all come to that building to help the students that are in the building. How are we maximizing each other's talents? And I think it goes to some of the things I shared with you that I know my weaknesses as much as I know my strengths. Mm-hmm. And whenever I have something I don't do well, I gotta go find that person who does right. it well, and I need, I need help. And how are we as, as leaders promoting that 
type of culture and mindset within the school and how are we as teachers pushing each other. And I, and I share one of the chapters actually in, in The Power of Connections and, 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 and somebody who we, I think, have a common friendship with Carl Hooker, I wrote about the difference with envy and jealousy is there was people I was envious of, you included, like people I see doing things that I want to do. That doesn't mean I would say anything negative. It's like, I want to get there. How am I going to get there? Right. I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to do better. I'm going to try. I'm going to do free sessions so then I can get the paid sessions. I'm going to try these different things. And through that mindset, I've grown, you right. know, not in a break my arm to pat myself on the back, but how I've elevated because I went to the people I saw doing some of the amazing things versus jealousy of like, oh, I'll just say negative things about them so right. I look better. And that's what this is about is how we use the the communal strength within a school to rise us up. There's, yeah, there's so much that uh, like I want to talk about that you're <laughs> just shared there. Um, I, I think one of the things that a lot of like, uh, I'll get an email, you know, from someone saying like, Oh, like our staff won't read this because you have this grammar error. And I'm like, all oh, right. right. I'm like, so if that, if that's their big contention, I like, I want to read their stuff. Where is their stuff online? Right. Like, and, like and where, from, where's their book? I want to see it. Like, where's right, their podcast? Don't listen to it. Right. Cause like, yeah. A challenge to put yourself. Yeah. Out when you, when you, when you put, this. when you put yourself out there, like, of course, like, you know, how much, you know, how much content I have out there. If you can't find a grammar error, you're not looking hard enough. Right. Like if you right. can't, I don't know. I still, I still don't know what a prepositional phrase is. And I probably end sentence with them all the time. I maybe just did. <laughs> I have no clue. Okay. So, so that, that is the reality of it too. And I think a lot of times it's like, it, it's kind of, I don't know if you've ever seen those TikToks. It's like uh, someone, you know, some some guy sitting on the couch eating chips uh, and uh, and uh, actually like watching a gymnast like fall over and uh, and, and, them, and they right? play and they play this. You're trash, kid. Right? Like like they <laughs> it's like literally that sound. They actually play it. It's like watching somebody else do like something amazing and not doing it perfectly while you're not even close to that, right? But if you want to get to that point, right, it is, I think that it's actually like, I actually made this chart with um, talking about like going from uh, fixed mindset, growth mindset to innovators mindset. And when I right. talked about the innovators mindset, it is like, instead of being bothered by someone's, you know, uh, abilities, it's actually learning from that as well. And saying Absolutely. like, Hey, like, yeah, of course, like, you know, uh, I, I don't know if you know this, but I've lost a lot of weight recently. Yeah, and I don't, awesome. I don't have, I don't have like, I don't have the genetics in my family that we're just like eating chips and having six packs. Like that's, you know, so there, <laughs> there, there's some disadvantages, you know, from maybe my genetics and maybe, and, and maybe it's not genetics. Maybe it's like, um, it's maybe how just our family eats, right? Like uh, Greek family, it's everything centered around food when we were kids and maybe right. have an unhealthy relationship with food. So, so I could say like, Hey, well, that person has, you know, has a six pack and they can do whatever they want. Or I could say like, okay, what are some of these things that that person has that I can do that I have the ability to do and learning from that and looking at that? Cause that's the only way I grow, right? Me complaining about some, that, that other person and say, well, they, they got this, they got this, they got this. That's not making me any better. It's, it's just like, I'm just trying know. to drag another person down, like right, it's trying, like to, trying to, time. yeah, right. And so kind of learning from that and maybe I'll never get to that point, right? I'm not going to be an Olympic gymnast. I'm not going to play in the <laughs> NFL. That time's up for me, but there's things I can learn from, right? Like Tom Brady, like I'm not going to play in the Still NFL, but it. I sure want to look young like that guy, right? Like right, he's uh, actually it. looks younger as he gets older, which is quite incredible, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's what the, the book's about is like maximizing our talents within our building as well. That's a lot of that. Hey, so Matt, it was awesome to have you. Like any final well, words, so any final words that you have for the audience here today? Um, I, I think that just going off of what, I, what we had said today, we talked a lot about maximizing your time when you do something. Don't just do something to do it. Maximize that time and then share it to other people because that's how we are, continue to grow and that's how we continue to be better as a profession by sharing ideas, by pushing each other because wherever we are in that in that journey, we can take another step. And, and I appreciate you saying that because we're going to list all your social media um, in the description <laughs> down below. And I know that you'll sure. connect with people that if they reach out to you, if they have questions, I know that I'm sure. Please. And, and hey, I just as a cu curiosity, uh, the leadership lounge is not closed, right? People can still 
Like no, so we we um, we had the leadership lounge, and then the success of that, right. uh, the teachers were saying, "Well, we can't come at, at right. ten o'clock on Fridays." So I did one in the evening. The educators who's lounge. coming at ten o'clock on a Friday? Like what teachers uh, awake? A lot of print- <laughs> right. So <laughs> what, teachers, what teachers are awake at ten on a Friday? No, ten a.m. Oh, okay. I was like, I was wondering. I was like, yeah, yeah, geez, no, if I was up till eight, that was a miracle. We, gotcha. Yeah, it was ten a.m. So t- so leaders. Gotcha. Lock that time down. Right. And teachers are like, we're teaching. So they said, we want to do one in the evening. So I did the educators lounge just because I was like, okay, what would be a compliment to that mm-hmm. phrasing? And then as I learned more of the summer and wrote stronger together in one of the chapters about yeah. we all can be leaders, right. I can't, I can't then have two. So we, I talked with Brian Aspinall and as you said, he, he sees some things. You innovators do. lounge. So, I like it. <laughs> yeah. We're going to make it our innovators lounge so that you can come and share your ideas. I love and it. It's still every Friday at 10 o'clock. And it's twice a month in the evening. If you follow, you know, at Matthew X Joseph or Codebreaker, you'll see the signups. Okay. I send out the link and join us. It's great. It's sometimes it's 10 people. Sometimes it's 40. It's just an open door meeting where we share ideas. Hey, well, thanks so much for being on. Uh, anyone who's interested in following uh, Dr. Joseph here, just actually check out social media there. Uh, congrats on the new book release. I, hope, I wish it all the success in the world. And uh, th- thanks for taking the time. I, I really enjoyed Thank our conversation. You. It's like weird how I think we like graduated <laughs> at the same time, basically did the same job at the same time. So yeah, that's kind of cool. So it's I awesome. love, love connect with you. So anyone, everyone, Bye. thanks for taking the time to listen. I, Matt, I hope you have a wonderful day.